When we think of a nuclear weapon, the image which usually comes to mind is the vast mushroom clouds of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or the Cold War tests in the Pacific and Russia. The destructive force of these weapons was measured in the thousands or millions of tons of TNT equivalent. These were city busters designed to flatten entire areas. But within the history of nuclear weapons development, there was another different but fascinating question, one that engineers worked on in the 1950s and 60s. And this was just how small could you make a nuclear bomb and still have it work? The idea of small isn't simply about shrinking explosive yield. It touches on the physics of chain reactions, the engineering limits of implosion, the logistics of deployment, and the politics of control. It also intersects with our modern day concerns about drones, terrorism, and proliferation. So this is the story of miniature nuclear weapons, from the physics of critical mass to the Cold War's smallest bombs and today's security nightmares. Unlike conventional explosives, nuclear devices can't simply be scaled up or down like sticks of dynamite. Certain isotopes such as uranium-235 and plutonium-239 are called fissile because their large nuclei are on the edge of stability. If one of these large nuclei is struck by a neutron, they can split, that's the fission part, into two smaller nuclei and in the process release two to three neutrons as well as about 200 mega electron volts of energy per atom. It's these two to three other neutrons that can then strike other atoms of uranium or plutonium, which can then split and then release more neutrons and then energy and so on and so forth until it becomes what's known as a runaway nuclear chain reaction. However, for this to happen, you need enough fissile atoms packed close enough together so that on average, each fission product releases at least one more fission. If the mass is too small, too many of the neutrons escape before hitting other nuclei and the reaction fizzles out. This is called subcritical. At the threshold where each fission leads to exactly one more fission, the material is then called critical. This is how nuclear reactors work. There is a chain reaction, but it's controlled and it doesn't run away. To make an atomic bomb, each fission has to produce more than one sustained reaction. It has to multiply the results with each stage. Then the reaction is known as supercritical. But even highly refined weapons grade uranium or plutonium won't explode by themselves. As the reaction starts, it heats up the material which makes it expand, making it less likely for neutrons to hit other fissile atoms and the reactions decrease. It has to be forced into a supercritical stage. And this is actually a very difficult process, not only to initiate, but also sustain long enough to make it a viable device before it blows itself apart. During the Manhattan Project, the World War II American project to build a nuclear weapon, it was theorized if you could compress a piece of uranium or plutonium, the atoms in it would be closer together and thus increase the chance of neutrons hitting other atoms to create a chain reaction. First, they came up with the gun type assembly, which was used in Little Boy on Hiroshima. This used two subcritical pieces of uranium-235, which were then slammed together by a conventional explosive, forming a supercritical mass. After they realized plutonium was more likely to go supercritical, they switched to the implosion type assembly as used in the Fat Man on Nagasaki and also in all later nuclear weapons. Here, a sphere of plutonium-239 is compressed by precisely shaped conventional explosive charges, making it denser so the neutrons are more likely to hit other nuclei before escaping. Both of these devices were large, weighing in at 4.4 tons for Little Boy and about 4.9 tons for Fat Man. They were so big and heavy that only the specially modified versions of the biggest bombers of the war, the B-29, could carry them. But these were effectively prototypes. The US only had two bombs and they had used them both. The Americans' threat to drop more bombs on more cities forced the Japanese into surrender, but it was an empty threat because they had no more bombs to drop. As soon as the potential of their power had been demonstrated, there was a race to make them on an industrial scale. And with this refinement, 
the size of the bombs decreased and their yield increased over the following years. As far as the actual piece of uranium or plutonium is concerned, these masses are surprisingly large. A sphere of pure uranium-235 requires about 52 kilograms to sustain a chain reaction. Plutonium-239, being more fissile, needs only about 10 kilograms, but that's already the weight of a heavy suitcase before you add anything else. But weapons designers soon learn tricks, like using a tamper to surround the core which was made from either beryllium, tungsten carbide or depleted uranium. These have the property of reflecting neutrons, so those that would normally escape out of the device would be reflected back in. The dense materials would also help the core stay together for a few microseconds longer, enough to dramatically increase the yield. If a tamper was made from depleted uranium, then the extra neutron reactions it would create would add even more to the yield. But this is why you can never have 100% conversion of the nuclear material, like plutonium, into energy. As soon as the reaction starts to run away, the heat created blows it apart and stops the reaction. The longer you can hold it together, even for millionths of a second, the larger the yield. However, using these methods also meant that the amount of plutonium-239 could go down to around three to five kilograms, making the bombs smaller and lighter. Soon, atomic bombs were being shrunk down to fit into aircraft-mounted missiles and eventually artillery shells. But even then, there's still several times the mass of a modern assault rifle. Once you surround it with conventional explosives, detonators, electronics, and a casing strong enough to withstand handling, you end it with something weighing around 20 to 30 kilograms. And that's not a briefcase sized device that you can carry through the streets easily. There were also issues in that the smaller the device became, the yield became much more variable and unpredictable. The W54 was the smallest nuclear device ever fielded and was designed in the late 1950s. It weighed just 23 kilograms, with a cylinder about 40 centimeters long by 28 centimeters across. To shrink the warhead down to this size meant giving up the tamper and enclosing the nuclear material in a cylinder of explosive. Unlike larger devices, which used many detonators and shaped charges to surround the core, this simple design used just two detonators, which were placed at either end of the cylinder. When detonated, the shockwaves would travel through the explosive in what's called a linear implosion. Because of the lack of tamper or lens to focus the shockwaves, the lack of equal compression made the design inefficient, but for small munitions or artillery shells, it was good enough, but wasteful in terms of mass versus yield. Because of the variability of the explosive surrounding the core, results could be highly variable from just working to working much better than expected. Its most famous use was in the Davy Crockett recoilless rifle. This jeep mounted or tripod mounted weapon fired a nuclear projectile with yields as low as 10 tons of TNT. The idea was to stop Soviet tank divisions from pouring through the folder gap into West Germany. But the weapon's maximum range was only about two kilometers, barely more than its own blast radius. In effect, firing it could be a suicide mission. It was also used in the AIM-26A air-to-air missile in 1956. This carried a W-54 with a increased 250 ton yield and was intended to be used against Soviet heavy bombers because the accuracy of guided missiles at the time was too low to guarantee a high number of kills. Put a 250 ton nuclear explosion nearby and there will be a much higher kill chance. The AIM-26A was the only nuclear air-to-air -air missile the US produced, but due to worries with its use over friendly territories, by 1972 it was retired. During the 1960s, the US and the Marines collaborated on a variant of the W-54 which was adapted into the Special Atomic Demolitions Munition, or the SADM, or SADM, which could be up to a one kiloton yield. This was a literal backpack bomb and called for a two-man team, which would either parachute behind enemy lines or arrive by sea to plant the weapon in a harbor or some other target, which was reachable by sea. They would plant the bomb, set the timer, and escape to a waiting nearby craft. In practice, the Saddam 
was more likely to be a weapon of psychological warfare than practical strategy. It also showed up the unpredictability of a small design with yields that could go from 10 to 1,000 tonnes of TNT, not the sort of thing you would want to be fired just a few kilometres away as with the Davy Crockett. Another approach was nuclear artillery. The W-48 warhead was developed in the 1960s to fit inside a standard 155mm howitzer shell. At 58 kilograms and 86 centimetres long, it looked just like any other artillery round, but inside was a miniaturised implosion system yielding about 72 tonnes of TNT. In theory, this meant that NATO commanders could call for nuclear fire support from ordinary artillery units. In practice though, firing even a small nuke blurred the lines between tactical battlefield use and strategic escalation. Although nuclear artillery shells were deployed, they were never used. Engineering these devices was never simple. Even at a small scale, a nuclear weapon requires a precisely symmetrical implosion system. Dozens of detonators firing within millionths of a second of each other arming and safety controls, as well as rugged casing to survive drops, shocks and transport. In bigger bombs, there was space for redundancy. In Minich devices, every cubic centimetre was precious. Cutting down on components increased the risk of failure. The W54 was again prone to wildly variable yields, sometimes only a few tonnes, other times approaching a kiloton. That kind of unpredictability made commanders nervous and even more so the artillery crews themselves. Deployment was also equally problematic. The Davy Crockett was actually fielded in Europe in the early 1960s. But the fact that the soldiers were expected to be within the fallout zone of their own weapon made the system almost unusable and it was retired within a decade. The SADMs lasted longer into the 1980s. Their main value was forcing Soviet planners to worry about hidden nukes sabotaging key infrastructure. But as time went by, conventional weapons increased in accuracy and there was no fallout effect if they were to be used on an area which was expected to be captured by friendly troops. This is the reason why the Soviets made massive bombs like the 50 megaton Tsar bomber. Their missiles weren't that accurate, but it doesn't matter if it's a kilometre or two off target when the total annihilation radius is 35 kilometres. So if the SADM was the Cold War's nuclear backpack, then drones are its modern equivalent. A 25 kilogram payload is well within the capabilities of larger unmanned aerial vehicles and even some commercial models. In theory, a compact nuclear charge could be flown into a target by remote control and be almost undetectable at very low levels. The physics and engineering problems still remain. Fissile material degrades, explosives require expert handling, and arming systems need to be tightly controlled. Non-state groups lack the capability to build such weapons, but the spread of drone technology has raised the alarm. Unlike missiles or bombers, drones are cheap, ubiquitous, and difficult to stop. A device once requiring a two-man team could be delivered by a remote control aircraft or drone. This leads to the nightmare scenario, a non-state actor, a terrorist group, obtaining a compact nuclear device. In the Cold War, delivery meant bombers, artillery, or special forces, all requiring state infrastructure. Today, drones are cheap, GPS-guided, and globally available. A stolen SADM-sized warhead paired with a large drone could devastate several city blocks, a major port, or even the seat of government of a country. Even a 10-ton yield, the lowest ever deployed, could kill hundreds and cause global panic. This is why governments place such an emphasis on securing fissile material and dismantling small warheads. By the mid-70s, both the US and the Soviets had come to the conclusion that having a large number of these backpack-sized nukes around was just too much of a risk of them falling into the wrong hands. The smaller a nuclear weapon is, it's harder to secure. In the 1960s, the US began fitting weapons with permissive action links electronic locks requiring codes to arm them. But these early systems were primitive compared to today's safeguards. Storage and handling posed a constant risk. A 30 kilogram backpack bomb is easier to smuggle, easier to lose, and harder to guard than a 10 ton missile warhead. By the late Cold War, both the US and Soviets had recognized the danger and withdrew their smallest weapons. 
But could we really go smaller? Could we make, say, a nuclear hand grenade? That really would be a suicide mission, wouldn't it? But no, the physics just won't work at that size. Even with advanced reflectors and compression, you still need several kilograms of fissile material for the core, and then several more kilograms of high explosives to compress it. That sets a minimum size, about the size of a backpack. Below that, the weapon simply won't function, or it will be so unstable that it becomes more dangerous to the user than the target. Today, nuclear deployment has shifted focus. Rather than physically smaller packages, designers have pursued lower yield, but with more highly efficient warheads mounted on precision missiles. These are obviously much larger than backpack devices, but they allow more controlled escalation in theory. Concerns about the briefcase nukes still persist, fueled by rumors of Soviet portable devices in the 1990s. This came about when in 1997, General Alexander Ledbed claimed that out of 132 portable devices, only 48 were found, implying that 84 were missing. Later, he revised his estimates to a broader range of 100 to 500 total, but probably closer to 100. Now, that's a pretty wide margin of error. Claims of dozens or even hundreds of missing devices stem from uncorroborated statements by certain political and scientific figures. These have been strongly denied by the official Russian sources, but we don't know if there were any ulterior motives behind them. The terminology of suitcase or briefcase bomb might well be misleading because it could have been taken to mean a small nuclear device to be used by special forces. After all, a suitcase can be a lot bigger than a briefcase. But there is just no evidence that anything approaching the size of a briefcase nuke had ever been produced by the US or the Soviets, although it has been a staple of spy fiction for decades, which keeps the idea alive, even if it can't be made with current technology. The story of miniature nuclear weapons is really a story of limits, of physics setting the floor size, of engineering struggling to make them safe, and deployment doctrines that bordered on suicidal and the politics that finally judged them to be too dangerous to keep. They remain a fascinating Cold War footnote and a reminder that in nuclear weapons, smaller doesn't necessarily mean better. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please thumbs up, share and subscribe. And a big thank you goes to all of our patrons for their ongoing support.